Thank you very much, Mr. Wehmeyer, for the friendly words of introduction. Dear colleagues from the German Bundestag, dear guests of the Kerber Foundation, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would, of course, like to welcome the person who's uh, got the main role today, and we've known her a long time, and uh, we've discussed German and European and international politics often with her, also yesterday, the whole evening, and we are uh, first welcoming her as the High Representative of the uh, European Union. Welcome, dear Frederica Mogherini. So as I said, uh, dear Frederica, this is the first official visit as the High Representative in Berlin, and I would like to assure you the city is in a good mood these days, just shortly after the anniversary of the fall of the mall. This is an anniversary which brought together a hundred, hundreds of thousands of people around the Brandenburg Gate and along the former wall uh, in Berlin. And this was a very emotional celebration, as we have it rarely in Germany. And maybe in Rome, on Brussels, wherever you were at the weekend, maybe you saw the pictures uh, of the white balloons uh, that uh, rose in the Berlin's night skies. White balloons, on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, uh, of course, they uh, were to be a memory of the fateful uh, moment of the Germans. At the other, on the other hand, however, this is what it was meant like was to be symbol of a peaceful hope for this world, which is uh, plagued by crises and conflicts uh, like never before. The fall of the war, when we knew this, and that's why I'm not going to comment on that much longer, was not just a fateful uh, moment for the Germans, but also it was a real uh, change in times, uh, which reaches far. So yesterday I came back from Kazakhstan, and there on the TV screens and the hotels, there was transmissions from Berlin, and Kazakhstan is a country which exactly one year after the reunification of Germany got gained its independence. And uh, there, too, in Kazakhstan, they remembered this 9th of November, 1989, and that was the start of the end of the decades of the division of the world, the end of the old bipolar order, with all its cynic uh, certainties, which uh, we should not want to have back. So the old order, as ladies and gentlemen, so without doubt, has been overcome. And fortunately, fortunately for us Germans and also for other parts of the world, but a new order is something that this world has not yet found. So, uh, uh, Richard von Weizsäcker uh, was uh, the head and the uh, of the Bergedorf uh, Roundtable, and I said two days ago, this is a world seeking an order, and this search is not uh, in a peaceful seminar, but this is a fight for influence and dominance, and as you can see currently, it's overlaid by ethnic and religious conflicts uh, that at the moment uh, have quite a threatening variety throughout the world. And I can, uh, can't remember any time in the last 25 years in which we had such a time with international crises of such different nature, so, uh, so, uh, so many different places in the world and all of this at the same time. So I can remember that over the past 25 years, we had such a situation, just as now. So naturally, I don't want to talk about the crises uh, individually. So of course, first and foremost, we're looking forward to how Frederica Mogherini uh, will comment uh, from a European point of view. So just, just a general phenomenon which uh, I uh, see uh, when I uh, observe the developments of the past years, and this across all the individual crises uh, we should uh, talk about, and that is there's a certain, and I call it, uh, boom of the opposites that we can see at the moment. So uh, we can uh, look at the crisis in the Ukraine, and uh, so 
long forgotten contradictions, reflexes of East-West co uh, conflict uh, becoming virulent again, or uh, the inhumane ISIS terror as an extreme expression of religious uh, basic conflicts. So when I look at the Facebook comments, uh, Mr. Wehmeyer from the last couple of days uh, about the reporting in the Gaza conflict and uh, the following uh, discussion with the social media, then unfortunately also with us, we've got uh, the ugly face of anti-Semitism as well, at least in the social media. And I'm quite happy that with a clear position in the German public, uh, we uh, will not permit this. Or with the Ebola and the waves of refugees, there's also something like uh, a new fear of dangers from the global south. The rich north and uh, doesn't want uh, this danger from uh, the south coming up, spilling over. And even with as handling our closest partners, the United States, the debate we have across the Atlantic is dominated more by the differences rather than the common ground. Sigma Gabriel, the federal economics minister, uh, just pinpointed uh, uh, recently, quite rightly, by saying, actually, Germans and Americans are actually com connected with a heraldic animal, the proud eagle, but the only animal which plays a role in transatlantic relations is the chlorinated chicken. So you can see it as an anecdote, but still, behind that, there is uh, a, a true core. And I don't know whether you share my observation, whether this is right or wrong, but what I feel is against the complexity of crisis and conflicts and causes, which we as foreign policy community know, all of us know this, against this complexity, what dominates in the public debate? And I mean both the language of the politicians, also the foreign policy and foreign uh, ministers, as well as in the reporting about foreign policy, what dominates is actually rather black and white and not so much the different shades of gray that are not defined properly. So this produces uh, further aggravation and more contradictions and opposites. So ladies and gentlemen, so if my analysis is not totally wrong, I identify a problem for the foreign policy. One of the many problems of foreign policy, because it's clear those who want to resolve conflicts, first of all, you have certain opposites and contradictions that you have to acknowledge. But in a conflict situation, you have to seek common ground, a common interest, and want to know who, under what prerequisites, will lose what. Only this is how solutions will emerge. This is seeking the common ground that foreign policy actually should never give up on. And this is the core business of diplomacy. So there's even examples where we were able to do this. So I'll mention Iran, and not by accident, by the way. So the conflict between the West and Iran, or between uh, the larger part of the world uh, community and Iran, I should rather say, is uh, lasting for decades. And there's been differences in the this conflict still. Despite the abundance of conflicts, there was a residual co awareness. So when we've got a potential disastrous nuclear question, despite the conflicts, we have to sit down at the table. And that is the reason why for 10 years there was dogged negotiations, and the negotiations now are at a point where, and I would say it cautiously, there is an end to negotiations oh, that is imaginable. A conclusion is imaginable. After uh, addressing the United Nations General Assembly, I said, so in different roles, so if I have been dealing with this uh, negotiation for 10 years, so and I think um, it's not quite wrong to say, so in the last year, of the 10-year ne negotiations, I suppose we achieved more than in all the nine years before, and that we were never closer 
than at the present point in time. So in other words, it is a chance, an opportunity that we have now. The problem is only we have to use it up to the 24th of November. That is the timeline that we have available and that is that not doesn't only demand flexibility, but that also demands leadership on all sides if a compromise is close to grasp to actually use this option, avail of it. And knowing all of all the difficulties that a mediating a compromise requires a solution for the inside as well as outside. So this is a make or break situation we are facing on the 24th of November. At the latest 24th of November, I'm saying this because I'm convinced that the situation will not come back so quickly. So if we let it pass on the 24th of November, there's got, uh, the extension of the negotiation will not bring the solution, not in the next two years. I fear that in the next two years that uh, go by without a result, we will rather have an aggravation of the situation. So the negotiations in Iran, I'll say this finally, by the way, is one example where Europe, if I may say so, European foreign policy took over the initiative, even though originally it actually was started by individual members of the union. And you noticed it and felt it over the past years, Frederica, where your predecessor Casey Ashton or Cathy Ashton, rather, um, led the negotiations for the European Union. Formally, it is a three plus three process and remained a three plus three process, but in the negotiations, Cathy Ashton uh, put forward and united the European positions. This was a procedure, I think, that uh, in the Iran negotiations, this has worked. This will not always work. However, uh, yesterday, Mrs. Mogherini and I talked about this. There will be situations time and again in the European foreign policy <coughs> where initiatives will evolve this way. Also from the initiative and the incentive maybe going beyond the individual member state. What is important is that in Europe we also found, find the common ground of our foreign policy interests. And for us in Germany this means only within and through Europe German foreign policy can be effective in the future, and only within Europe, together in Europe, we can actually gain global weight. This is true for all the large tasks, for all the conflicts uh, where European activities and responsibilities are recognized, but this is true also where we have to uh, subjects to further development. So the Weimar Triangle, for instance, we try to make some suggestion about the new alignment of European neighborhood policy or uh, take it together but coordinated with a new uh, high representative. I talked with a British foreign uh, minister a couple of days ago in Berlin and we developed an initiative for the Western Balkan for uh, Bosnia. Herzegovina, for instance. So in other words, time and again, there will be such situations in which there are individual states that are putting forward an initiative, and from the European point of view, they will be welcome if they all lead to a common European activity. So we're not going to be able to do that everywhere. So we're going to be limited to those cases where we've got the impression that um, we can make a difference. So we will contribute stronger where we have the impression that we have more to offer in certain issues than maybe others have, and we will be able to live well with it if in other areas others will have the better prerequisites uh, in other conflicts. So what I will promise, and this is what I did outside, but I said that to the media, Liebe dear Frederica Mogherini, so we're going to be a team player, and we'll do everything in our strength to help you in your difficult task to bring together 28 European member states and uh, they don't always have the same interests and 28 different memories and own national history so with these 28 member countries 
to actually bring them together in a common foreign policy. So this is what we're going to support you in, Frederica. Thank you very much.